So first of all, please, a round of applause for Adam, our sax player. And if you play drums or bass, please contact him. It would be great to get a band here. <laughs> Maybe next time. But all right, so I am Juan Antonio Osorio Robles, or Oz, it's a little easier. And Adam Young, again, our sax player. And yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about Oslo policy, um, teach you a little bit about access control, how do we use it in OpenStack, how to write policies. Uh, this is a very basic talk, we're not assuming that you know anything, but hopefully we'll teach you a couple of things. So, yeah, what is it? There you go. So why? Right, so why are we even doing this? Why is this not just a live why, gig why of Adam? Are we doing this? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, chances are everybody's deployment is different. Uh, chances are the default policies are not enough for you. And it's very probable that you're already changing the policy, but are considering that it might not be enough. So um, we thought it would be appropriate to start teaching folks more about it, um, given the docs are quite extensive, but um, it's just nicer to have somebody teach you, right? So we'll try to keep it simple. Uh, we'll try to teach the basics. Oslo policy? <laughs> so yeah, Oslo. Oslo, uh, as some of you might know, and here we have the PTL as well. Hey, Ben. Uh, is the set of libraries that are common for OpenStack, they try to enforce um, standards and common practices, and Oslo policy is just one of them. It does access control, and, oh, access control. Access control. <laughs> so who can do what, right? Um, usually you assign roles or attributes to your users or to whoever ha wants to do something in a system, and you'll have rules to define who can do what, right? So these rules are enforced, and we call this authorization, and that's the gist of access control. You can search more in Wikipedia, but for our purposes, this is the main thing of it. So let's take a very simple example, just a bakery. And um, I live in Finland, so it's all Finnish names. Uh, Finnish pastries. Those are Finnish pastries, I'm a bit hungry. But uh, yeah, let's say Kim is a baker. Uh, he can bake bread, and it's all good. He has the, his baker certification. He can manage uh, food, and, and it's all good. Pilvi is a cashier, and she manages money and deals with customers, right? Given that Kim is a baker, he's not allowed to be with the... Uh, he's not allowed to deal with customers, to deal with money. And given that Pilvi is not a professional baker, she's not allowed to bake. So this is access control in a gist, right? A user has a role and can execute an action on a target object. This is what is our main concern. Now, you could have several shops, right? So Kirsti is the owner of the shop, and Kim works for Kirsti, Kirsti right? Uh, Eric is the owner of the Norwegian bakery, the competition, and Olve works for Eric. So even though Kim and Olve are both working for a bakery, they cannot work for the competition. So this is scoping, right? You, can, you scope the work of Olve towards the Norwegian bakery. So the one that authorizes Olve and Kim to work at the specific bakeries is the owner. So. Yeah. One important thing to note, and that usually people get confused by, is that authorization is not the same as authentication. Uh, authorization is who can do what, are you allowed to do it, while authentication defines the identity of the user or whoever is trying to do something. So access control in OpenStack. Let's talk a little bit about it. Let's take a sample request. Uh, we have our, our rockstar here that wants to just list the servers of their OpenStack deployment. And um, in order to do it, he needs to be allowed to do it. So the first thing that he's gonna talk to is Keystone. Keystone is the identity service for OpenStack, which you might know. And 
First of all, you will authenticate to it and it will give you back an access token or a bearer token. With that token, you can now try to do operations in your OpenStack installation. It could be Neutron, it could be Nova, let's say Nova. So the first thing that you're gonna do, you're gonna try that curl request right there, get your servers, and it'll give that bearer token. OpenStack itself is um, layered into several pieces of middleware, one of them being Keystone middleware. There's also a bunch of more like um, stuff for audit and whatnot, but in, for our case, it's Keystone middleware, the important one. And that piece of middleware is just this small uh, piece of software that, whose only role is to talk to Keystone, verify that the token is valid, and get user data. Right, so it'll talk to Keystone, give it the token, hey, is, is this token valid? Or has it expired, or I mean, can I use this? You guys have seen Office Space, right? Middleware is the guy who takes the plans and brings them to the customer. <laughs> it's the middle piece, it's gotta be in there, it's gotta be in, yeah. the, in the way, and that's the way that we're able to enforce it. And you need to know that even though you're talking to Nova, you're talking to a little piece of Keystone too. Yeah. So subsequently, you're gonna get a, request, a response of it. Like, yes, this token is valid, go forward. Or maybe not, like, this token is, I, I don't know this, or it has expired, it wasn't valid. So it'll give a lot of information back about the user, about our rockstar over there. And the middleware then can decide, okay, let's pass on this information towards Nova, and then Nova will do whatever it needs to do. Now, as mentioned, Keystone Middleware verifies the token and gives you a lot of information. Um, all of the information that you know already from OpenStack, the user ID, the name, project ID, domain ID, is the token valid? What are the roles, which is a very important thing, what are the roles for that user? So all of this is uh, filled up by Keystone Middleware. So now we get to Oslo policy, right? Um, also policy, I put a lot of information there, but um, it's a small library that all of the OpenStack uh, services use. Um, and it provides several things, right? It, it is a small library, so you usually, uh, well, it allows you to write your policies. So you will write your policy in a language that is YAML or JSON. It doesn't really make that much of a difference. It's very similar in both ways. and. It allows you to do, uh, enforce the rules, to specify default rules, and to read the rules, right? So default rules are usually stored by the project in, in code. So you would need to know a little bit of Python to actually be able to read it nowadays. Um, it's called by the service. So the service is responsible for coding the calls to enforce policy. It's not a piece of middleware, it's, it's a library. Hey Oz, is that true everywhere? It's not true everywhere. It's not true everywhere. So, not everybody has done policy in, in, uh, in, in code. It's, the, it's something that's happening. You'll see it in a lot of the projects, but not, not all of them. And uh, that's one of the gotchas. There's a lot of gotchas here, which is, I guess. That's why we're here. Why we're here. But, uh, but yes, Keystone does it in code. Barbican does it in code. Neutron still doesn't do it in code yet. Um, there's also another gotcha. When you're updating your policy, usually some services just read the policy automatically. So they will check when the policy was last modified and automatically refresh it. So that's very nice because you only need to change this Etsy Nova policy.json or Etsy Barbican policy.json. However, not all services do this. For Keystone, for example, you need to refresh. So it requires a lot of tribal knowledge about which project does what. We are trying to standardize, but there's still a lot of gaps. We're your tribe. But it's in process, we're trying. So access control, how do we map access control from the abstract concepts of the bakery to Oslo policy, right? Or, well, now OpenStack, right? So again, a user has a role to execute an action on an object. Kirsti is an admin, so that's the admin role, and can create, that's the action, Users, which is the object, right? So in Oslo policy, we have three main concepts, right? We have the credentials, which describe the user. So credentials contain uh, the username, it contains the domain, but it, it also contains the roles. So 
that's the credentials. The rule is the rule name. So get servers, create or list projects and whatnot. So that's the rule. And the target is information about the object. So what type of object is it? What project does it belong to? Domain information and whatnot. So that's the target. And another gotcha. A lot of OpenStack projects define the target in non-standard ways, right? So Barbican, for example, fills it up in a very different way than Nova, for instance, which is also something we're trying to standardize. Uh, I'm going to go really quickly towards the language of policy, but uh, I mean, it's, it's a really simple language. You don't need to dig too much into it. And we're going to go through examples, which is the main thing. So that's hopefully how you're going to learn it. But, uh, as I mentioned, it's a very simple language. It's just a key and a value. So the, the name of the rule or the target, rule target, and the implementation, right? So you can have lots of different things. Uh, one of them is, hey, always allow. Like this operation is very safe. Uh, no problem, always allow anybody to do that. Um, there is another one if you really want to restrict users from doing certain operation, you can always deny, right, which is this exclamation mark. Um, as any other languages, you have your and rules or, or rules. Uh, you, have, you can negate a rule. You can group them with parentheses. We're going to see them a little bit more in the examples, right? And you can also specify a default rule. Let's say that somebody tried to do something that the service is not really acquainted with. You can deny by default, for example. This is not very common nowadays, but uh, it used to be. Uh, role checks. Let's check that for the compute get all, the role of the user that tried to do that is lister. You can specify aliases in order to make your rules a bit more readable, right? Role admin or creator, now you have a rule especially for that. And you can do external checks. So you could also write your own check that will receive the data and just return the string true. So this is very specific, but you can do that. And Oslo policy itself is also uh, extendable. You can do custom checks as well. And in a subsequent talk, uh, lightning, talk lightning talk actually today, I, I'm going to talk about how I did uh, an open policy agent check for Oslo policy. And yeah, finally, for example, you can check with a, uh, with a specific string. But one important thing to note, for example, the last one is project ID equals project ID. That is the format of how you check a, the credentials with the target, right? It's not very intuitive, but it's explained as well as in, the, in the documentation. The left would be the project ID for the user, the credentials, and the right one would be the target. So yeah, that's all for the theory. Uh, well, there's still a bit more coming, but uh, now it's Adam's turn. You guys probably feel like I do right now, don't you? You're actually the you people. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, you know, I'm trying to be a little more inclusive on my language, get that. OK, are, is this stuff like dry as toast? Bored out of your minds? It, it should be. I mean, this stuff really should be bread and butter. Um, and we, we seem to be on a bakery theme here. I think we were hungry when we made this presentation. Um, this is uh, obviously at the heart and soul. To me, this is what OpenStack is all about. OpenStack is a way of scaling um, your operational capacity. And your technology can scale hugely. It can scale to you know, millions of nodes. It doesn't matter if your organization doesn't scale. And that's what policy is there to do, is to make it possible for you to take what works in a small group and duplicate it and clone it in a larger group. Well, what works is you have a set of roles. And we've talked about those before, our, our baker role, or our admin role, or our member role. And then you have a scope. And OpenStack works in this. So the policy language that Oz just described, it's actually a generic rules engine. There's very little in it that's, that's OpenStack specific. Probably the only thing I would say that is specific to OpenStack is the role check, because a role is kind of an OpenStacky concept. But really, you could use 
OSLO policy to, to do any sort of yes, no check you needed to, and um, Neutron has done some stuff like that. What I want to talk about now is what it means to do this within the context of OpenStack and this idea of the scope being separate from the role and the, the two need to vary independently. What the scope is is, did I get that right? Yeah. yeah. All right. What's the scope? The scope is a really foul tasting mouthwash. So you want to go and get the green one. Because if you use the, oh my God, these guys are dead. Um, scope is the label that you use to say who owns, or not who, but what owns a resource. How many people here have heard the term project? Okay. How many people have here have heard the word tenant? Okay. How many people know that they're actually the same thing? How many people here know that I'm to blame for that? Okay, good. At least somebody. Yeah. There's a, there's a standard thing, which is Keystone sucks and it's all my fault. And by my, I mean me. Um, yeah, so when we're talking about scoping, for the primarily thing that we're talking about is that project or tenant ID. And project is the standard term for it, by the way, and you can blame NASA for that, who, of course, is no longer really contributing to the project. Um, just to confuse the term. So the project ID is, is a label that's on every resource. And I think every resource in OpenStack has a project ID, ID on it. Um, users do not. They're, they're the one things that are different. We'll talk about those in a bit. Maybe some of the credentials in Barbican do not have project IDs. Those are owned by individual things or owned by domains. Everything else, and if we're talking neutron networks, images in glance, um, whatever they have in Sahara, I am, I'm assuming some sort of uh, wild animal, they're all scoped to a project. What you can do is based on the role that you have. And um, yeah, as I said, a couple of things are not owned by projects, and those are things that are usually owned by users, and, but they're still scoped. Is scoped to an individual user. So understanding that those two things that should vary, the role that you have and the resource that you're talking to. And so let's go through what the policy looks like for a neutron network. Okay, so specifically we're going to talk about a subnet. Uh, just to pick one concrete object out of the bunch. And so if you create a subnet, you make some web call, and it's going to resolve down to making this policy call here, create subnet rule, admin or network owner. Now, you remember before where Oz said that we could have aliases. When you use rule like that, that's basically saying look elsewhere in the file for the actual implementation of it. And so this admin or network owner is really just a string at this point. It's supposed to be descriptive. This is, a, this is an attempt to get somewhat self-documenting in our code. So rule, context is admin, or tenant ID, percent, network, colon. That's that format that Oz was just talking about before, right? So we have two distinct things. The tenant ID, and what's missing here? We don't really have a role check, do we? Okay, so let's talk about it with a little bit more proper scoping here. First of all, we're gonna say, we have this thing, rule admin. And this is a fairly common pattern. I don't know that I would continue this, but this should be unsurprising to people who've looked at our policy files. That rule is defined that either you have some magic is admin flag passed in from Neutron, and that does happen. That's usually a, something that's said in a config file. It exists, you should know it exists, you really shouldn't count on it. Or you have the admin role and, 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 the, and the parentheses are important here. Those two are together and that whole thing is added together with the scope check. So we have two parts here now in our admin check, which is the role matches or, excuse me, the role matches and the, the uh, project uh, matches. Now network owner is this new rule that we're adding in there. And you can see that those are ORed together in our bottom level rule. Rule, member, role, which is the same kind of rule that we saw before, you know, that would say role, colon, member, and the tenant ID matches. So the, the thing that I cut out of here, and this shows that I really should have my slides better uh, troubleshot, is that rule, member, role actually can include the admin role as well. And that's a way that you can build up more complex roles. And in fact, I think we see that uh, later on. Um, so if you look here, this one right here, I have a little note here. Uh, this shows bug 968696, okay? Um, how many people know what is bug 968696? Okay? How many people know me? Okay, I, that's why nobody knows 9686. If you know me, you know that I know this bug by name. This is the oldest bug in the bug tracker for just about every project. 
okay? If you go and you sort by like oldest to newest or numeric ID in Nova, Nova in Neutron, in Keystone, all that, you're gonna see bug 968696. And what this bug is, aside from being, you know, kind of alliterative and easy to say and all that, admin anywhere is admin everywhere. And this is an error propagated from the myths of time where we did not properly scope. If, if a policy rule checks only that the role is admin, that means it doesn't matter what you've had admin assigned to you from, whether it was a project or whether it was a, whatever it is, it will pass the policy check. This means that you can, and we're not really too good on saying, okay, this is only used for certain things. This rule, admin, is everywhere. So this is something that we need to fix. So as we go through these next two, this example I was working through here, you can see that we wanna make sure that when we check that you have the admin role, that it's also on that project, or you have some other magic way of saying it's the right one, and that's a mechanism that's coming for that. But the, the important thing is just to say, your role needs to be on the project, and if it's the admin role, and it's on the admin project, or it's, it's not scoped to the right project, the, the policy check should still fail. Does that make sense? Okay, I hear muttering, that's good, that means you're talking about it. Either that or you know, you're going, is this guy nuts and I need to get out of here. Um, this is one of the most important concepts when you start writing your own policy files to make sure you have right, okay, that you're properly scoping your, uh, your checks. Okay, so <clears throat> why do we have roles? So you can di differentiate who can do different things. You can see that we have two different checks here. Um, the, uh, the get subnet here is gonna use the rule member or rule share or rule reader. I don't know where shared came from. Um, member says that you have the member role. Reader says that you have the reader role. But what you could have, let me see if I do that on the next slide. Now, adding nope. a reader role. Uh, okay, so um, you might have certain APIs such as get subnet, which are okay for you to do as a reader. This is kind of a, a non side effect causing role. Basically, gets when we're talking HTTPS. If you look at our earlier example, we were creating a subnet, and there we're saying we want you to at least be a member or the network owner, right? The, you have the member rule. Here, we're saying to get the subnet, just to read that, that's okay to do as a reader. And these are the, the distinction of the two different types of example uh, policies you need to implement in order to do a reader role. You always need to check scope. You always need to check what? Scope. What? Scope. What? Oh, God, you got it dead. Okay, <laughs> scope. Yeah, but uh, you know, I'm not gonna stand up here and stand my foot and say you need to remember something. But remember scope. Okay. Um, Let's go back a little bit, two slides. Go back two slides. Yes. So Properly just want scoping. To know about it. Um, the, the way that currently you can fix this is using this uh, checking for the scope in the policy. And that's true for most releases. There is work ongoing to define the scope inside the policy in code. However, as we mentioned, before, not all projects take that into use yet. So it's gonna yeah. take a while. So right now, this is the way to fix it right now. Checking scope in your policy. Yeah, probably worth mentioning is when you're looking at the policy files and trying to figure out how to customize them, if it's doing a scope check, leave it alone. Make sure that, that that's still done. You're not gonna be able to get that more correct. The part of the policy file, the part of the policy rule that you should be adjusting is what role is allowed to do something. And that should be what maps your organization. A good example is, going back to our network things, there might be a class of users that are allowed to use networks. They can create virtual machines and attach them to networks, but you don't want them messing with the networks themselves. So you might take all the Nova um, APIs and say, the member can do that there. You might take most of the, the majority of the Neutron APIs and say, you have to have some special network role in order to be able to do that. And so those are the kind of customizations you do with the policy file to enforce who can or cannot do operations. Um, that, that one, the example right there is one that actually, Dreamos, who I have been a customer of for many years, um, they, they actually do it that way. That's, that's not an unusual policy. All right, nice. So where did we get this policy from? Okay. so. Um, if you go back in the midst of time, each project had an Etsy directory, a project, in this case, I'm 
uh, I should say, services, each of the various um, sub-projects under OpenStack, such as Nova and all that, had an Etsy directory in their code repository, and you would see a policy.json file in there. And at some point, they disappeared, and a lot of people were like, where do these things go? Um, well, a lot of them went into code. A lot of them are annotations on the, um, the, the, the various APIs and say, okay, this is what the default policy should be. So if you don't have any policy.json file, there will still be something that's enforced, okay? Oslo Policy Generator with the, um, with, with the flags that you see here, so say service name in this case would be identity or compute. It's not Keystone or Nova, it's identity, compute, and so forth, the, the good names. Um, that will show you what is the default policy file. And you can generate, and you can actually pass in another parameter, which, which will say do it as JSON or YAML. And then if you want <clears throat> the really, really uh, verbose one that gives you uh, documentation, I think we see that in the next slide. Um, it was Keystone. Yeah, so here's the example with Keystone. And you can see that you will get um, a description of the API in there. Uh, so in this one, it says, you know, list ports or interfaces. It shows you the APIs that you're actually going to call. It's, it, it chops off the host name and all that kind of stuff because that hasn't been pre-calculated. But HTTPS colon Keystone 5000 blah, or in this case, Neutron, to be able to do that. And you can see the, the, uh, the squiggly braces in there uh, around server ID. Those are templateized values. So those would be the actual server IDs that you would be passed in. Um, this is the format that the internals of the, the Python code uses to generate the URLs. And then at the bottom, you see the same policy rules that we were talking about earlier um, at, at, um, as the final step. And so there'll be a stanza of each of these within the, the generated file. Okay, so you gotta customize policy. How do you make sure you've got it right? You don't wanna just do this on a live server. And you can spin up DevStack or spin up a server like that and, and test against it, and you probably should but there's an easier first step. Um, when we were doing this, uh, we quickly identified that we wanted to have the same check performed when we made a change as was gonna happen in the code without having to run a live server. And so we built the, the, the Oslo Policy Checker. And this is a CLI tool that is inside the Oslo Policy Library. And you use um, various parameters to figure out how you're gonna run it. If you just pass in the access file, this is basically a snapshot of that token data. You do a, um, a keystone token get dash dash debug and you'll see what that token data really is. And it's a, 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 you know, a, a JSON blob that has your rules and all that in there. So you cache that in a file and you can cache two or three or four different versions of that and you can run your policy against those and say, okay, this is what an admin token would look like. This is what a member token would look like. This is what an admin token would look like on project X versus project Y and so forth. And you can say, okay, I'm really just checking the you know, create and subnet rule. Let me pass in a flag that says just check this rule or if I leave that off, it will check the entire uh, Neutron API. Whatever is in that third flag, um, uh, well, excuse me, in that first flag, that dash dash policy, so, um, it will check all the rules in there if you don't specify. And then you, Oz, who is, as I'm sure is clear by now, slightly smarter than me, um, I was saying, okay, I need to be able to check, oh, I also want to be able to vary the project ID. And he's like, I need to vary a lot of stuff. So this is brand new, the dash dash target, um, to be able to build that target object that you're going to pass in to say, hey, this is what different neutron networks look like, or this is what different Barbican uh, secrets. secrets look like, thank you. Uh, I should know that better. Um, this is what the target looks like for the, uh, the resource that I am controlling. And so if I wanted to switch out the project ID, well then I can switch it in that target file. And so I might have three or four different target files for a given resource to say, hey, this is what it looks like, and I wanna do it where the project IDs match and don't match and see that I get the right results. And then in order to test it, um, what I find is I do these last three steps. Start off with the vanilla one. Start off with your original one and run it and send the output to a file. And the thing that I've learned is you sort it because you wanna make sure if you make any changes that you always do a diff between two things that the rules are, the, the, the rules checks are the same. And then you make your changes and you do the same thing and use diff. Um, and that will show you, hey, in the last time it passed, this time it failed, that's good. 
The last time it passed, this time it passed, you see no diff, you should see a diff, you know that you haven't got your rule correct. And it seems simple, but this little workflow right here, iterated um, ad nauseum, will get you to the point that you have policy the way you want to do. And in fact, we're working on building a, uh, something for O, which allows us to do the same kind of thing in the, in the larger, uh, larger sense. Okay, I think we're up to the, the question slide. Um, what do we have, 10 minutes for questions? Or, or, or one minute? No, we do have around 10 minutes, I think. Oh, awesome. That's okay. Great. Okay. Hopefully I've confused you all thoroughly and you have a million questions. Um, if not, I'm gonna start picking people out of the audience to ask questions. But I see Sean's up, so at least we got, we've got a plant um, in, the, in the audience. And this is actually payback, because I was the first guy to ask questions for, uh, for his talk, so. Indeed. Um, hey, Sean. Hello. Uh, so when you talked about uh, generating the, uh, the admin token data, do you have uh, examples of, of doing that in practice so that we can go back and, and do that on our clouds? Um, well, as I said, you can run uh, Keysto uh, excuse me, OpenStack token fetch um, from the command line, dash dash debug. And, and you can, you can and the, so the example will be in there. So you, you can do it from that. There's a handful of examples, I believe still in, um, I think Keystone, I think Keystone middleware. There are, there are uh, example of what old tokens look like, including old V2 versions of those. Um, but I think I would just generate one from an actual server and cache that and then edit it. And you'll see where the roles lists are in there and you should be able to add additional ones in and stuff like that. Once you see the, the initial one, um, you can chop out the whole service catalog, which is about 90% of the bulk of that. Right. You don't need that because we don't actually check policy on any of the service catalog things. Um, but yeah, there's a cached version. I want to say, it might be in Keystone middleware still, or it might be in Keystone. Look under Okay, so it's examples. some part of the uh, JSON response contains that. Yeah, and in fact, in the, um, the, uh, the repo that we're building, the one I'm currently hosting in Pajor, I actually have two or three <laughs> examples on there. And that's, you know, you're laughing because, um, so I, I'm only half kidding when I say Sean's a, a plant. He's a, a, contra a consultant that works with our customers and has actually had to go through this process and build a read-only role for a customer. And so the, the what we're doing is we're taking familiar. what he did there. Uh, Say again? The, uh, the rules look a little familiar up yeah, there. Yeah, they should, shouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, based on that. Great so, talk, so there's a couple examples in that repo um, that will, and we'll be plussing those up exactly that to have different projects and we need to, now that we have the target option too, to be able to build a, a bunch of those for those. Okay. All right? Awesome. Thank you. Good talk. Thank you. Yeah, come on up. A uh, uh, question about the versions of OpenStack. This basic stuff, what version of OpenStack does it require to work generally and for the stuff that Neutron hadn't implemented, what are, is that missing right? What can't we do with that right now? Okay, so um, there's a couple different answers depending on which part you focus on. Um, let me start on the latest part first. The dash dash target flag um, approved and merged prior to the summit. So that's, that you'll have to get tip of tree, but that for your, your own work, you could do a pip install of that or, or whatever, that should be fine for being able to do that. That's the only thing that's changed on the policy side of there. The rest of the enforcement is the same. You just have that additional flag in there. Right. Moving back through the presentation to some of the earlier stuff, policy and code has been an ongoing um, uh, effort. effort. Um, I remember we were talking about it at the first Vancouver summit, so you, you have to go back. I think Liberty and stuff like that, you'll start seeing it there. Keystone only got it about three or four releases ago. Glance doesn't have it yet. So really, that's on a project by project basis. Um, Oslo policy, the rules that it enforces, has not changed in forever. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yeah, so basically, you can use the Oslo policy to make a read-only role for like old versions. You could do it for Cactus. Okay. No, you couldn't do it for Cactus. They weren't doing policy back then. In the back of the room. Uh, greetings. Uh, just a quick question. You showed earlier that under slash etc slash service something there is the policy JSON. Since greens all this is containerized, how do I get to the policy of a containerized service? Don't want to break in the container. 
It's a configuration file, and wherever you would find your configuration files, you find it there. Now, if you're talking triple O and how do you want to generate new ones there, I think you actually need to generate them in the triple O environment format, and then they will be generated into that for you, and we didn't cover that here because that's kind of triple O specific. Um, but the, the short answer is wherever you would find your keystone.conf, right next to that you'll find your policy.json, assuming that you generate one. You may not have one. If it's using policy and code and it has made no changes, there may actually be no policy. And that's why those last those last two are so important because if you want to actually document this and, and, and deploy it in such a way that somebody could modify it, then you'll want to run this and, and, and stick those in there. Um, I believe uh, for, for triple O at least, the config directories are, are bind mounted from under var. Did everybody catch that? Nope. There's going to be a quiz. <laughs> it, it's under var lib, um, and you know, look at the triple O documentation. It depends on your deployment mechanism where 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 it lives, but it's basically bind mounted into the container. Okay. okay? But assuming your uh, deployment engine doesn't bind mount them, then yes, you have to go inside the container and modify that file. Okay. There, there is a documentation for this, I assume. Something that I can read and understand. Understand oh, it no. for me. What is it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Documentation for we what? We fear change. He asked for doc documentation or something you can read and understand about where you would find those files. Yeah, and how to get them into the containers. What deployment engine are you asking about? So that's trip. I mean, are you talking about specifically triple O? I'm using um, um, OSP 13 triple O director. Oh yes, if there is. Well, director. there is no documentation about it, but uh, there yeah, is there a specific is. format to do it. If you so, need docs, I could write them though. So. <laughs> Um, Sorry about that. I, I do know that in, um, at least in the OSP version, I think this is taken straight from upstream, um, to be able to customize policy, you can pass it in as environment variables. Okay. And in fact, usually what you'll do is you'll generate a, a policy.yaml for your whole deployment. And so do you do a redeploy of the overcloud with that in there, and they end up in the right places. If you're working with puppet managed files, and, and policy is often puppet managed, um, and you make changes, don't be surprised when puppet changes them back on you. That's, there's nothing I can do about yeah, that as a policy guy. That's just, that's just the, uh, the painful world we live in. Um, but there is documentation about how to customize policy as part of triple O and as part of, of um, OSP. Okay, thanks. Sure. You guys just want to hear me play saxophone in, right? No, that'll clear the room. All right. Any more questions? We got uh, a hand over there? Yes. No, we got two. That one right there? Magic. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit complicated because the target, as I mentioned, uh, the target format varies depending on the service. So Neutron has its own. Barbican has its own. So, so for instance, right here, where it says tenant colon network ID. Wow, I really butchered that, didn't I? Network colon tenant ID. Um, that's what you would expect to see in the JSON in the target. So it's really going to be dependent on which API you're calling, what that's going to look like. And as, this is new. This is like something that we built to support ourselves. So we will better document this as we, we, we come up with examples of it. Um, but the short of it is the, uh, the, doc, the, the targets are usually pretty flat dictionary, and so you would just expect to see um, JSON in there, which would be project ID, colon, and then whatever the actual ID is. So it's, it's usually a fairly flat dictionary. The best way is just to read the default policy files and see the references to targets and try to, try to get the target from there right now. Yeah. Uh, wasn't there someone else to go before? Me? Yes. So you remember before, the, the question was, uh, how fragile are they? Um, on the role side, um, you're probably fine. You're supposed to modify the role check. That's supposed to be your, your um, 
your uh, organizational specific part of it. Don't change the scope check. Don't change parts that reference um, like the target or stuff like that because chances are you're going to get it wrong. That's really an engineering decision. I would actually like it so that as we split the code, that stuff is stuff that you couldn't override. I'd really like it so that the policy check was just overriding the, um, the role part, but we're not there yet. Um, so the, the short of it is um, you might have something that, that looks like it runs fine, and then you'll just find that workflows fail because you're not providing the right roles. Um, years ago, I had this dream of something that was kind of like SE Linux in permissive mode to be able to run an open stack workflow and see what would happen. And then you just say, everything passes, but this would have failed. We don't have that. Um, we might build that someday, but we don't have that yet. OK? Um, but in general, uh, if you're not getting stack traces, at least you know your, your policy is valid uh, syntactically and stuff like that, you should be OK. And then test, like everything. You know, not just the, the checks that I, I had before. You should always do this in a, uh, you know, a scale-up uh, cluster and have, you know, have workflows that check the policy you just changed before you deploy it into production. Something like Tempest. Something like Tempest, yeah. Um, one other question I have. Yeah, sure. Is there a master list of what variables are defined per service? So you have the tenant ID checking network colon tenant ID. Is that, is that documented anywhere where the, which ones are defined? Uh, it is not documented, but um, it is, people are trying to standardize it. So on some services, it started to vary. So now we try to pass the, the context. So at some point, if we manage to pull it off, it'll be the same for all services. I don't really want you touching that. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, That's yeah, you, 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 you can go in there and do unspeakable things if you want. And, and there's, there might be some good reasons for that. In general, if you look at the API documentation for the API that you're doing, and that's one of the reasons why I showed this, because you need to figure out, hey, what is the API for the policy I'm modifying? Yeah. So say you want to modify uh, the uh, OS attach interfaces. You need to know that, hey, I can go to the documentation for Nova here. If you expand that out, it will show you the, the response objects. And typically, those targets are those response objects. They're the objects coming out of the database in a format. They might be nested one level deeper. In the, uh, in, the, in the Oslo, I mean, in the documentation, might have a compute at the front of it that you don't need, but it's going to be in that format. OK. Awesome. Yeah. OK, we're at 1421. Um, there's another question over there. And there is one last question. Uh, you talked about uh, check policy. Yeah. That's why I pointed this out at the bottom. That's exactly what I was doing. You run it first and cache it, right? You run it before you make any changes and cache it and, and sort it before you cache it because you're going to want to check it sorted and then make changes and then diff. That's the workflow. We don't have a cached version of what it would look like because to be honest with you, if you start varying up the, the roles that you have and the targets that you want to do this against, you're going to far exceed what, what we could provide. Okay, but that's, that, that, is, that should be the answer to your question. This is how you generate those. Okay? Any other questions? Any other answers? Go away. <laughs>